Step 3, 3G repeaters. In this final step, we're going to take a look at the third generation of quantum repeaters. So, we saw that communication without pre-shared entanglement is difficult. In that way, when we don't share entanglement pre, uh, prior to our communication, we have to uh, transmit the message directly. Technologically, this is easy because there's very little processing and there's modest memory requirements. But on the other hand, the distance over which we can communicate in such a way is very limited. If the distance is short, then we can send our qubit uh, psi directly. And there's a fairly okay chance that it's going to arrive. If the distance gets longer, we might have to wait a little bit uh, uh, longer as well, but it's still possible. But if the uh, distance increases uh, past a certain point, then there's almost no chance that uh, we're going to um, communicate. We're almost always going to lose the qubit due to the attenuation in the fiber. And we saw that a way of getting around this is to use pre-shared entanglement. And first establish entanglement between uh, end nodes and then use teleportation. This was technologically a lot more demanding. We had to use quantum memories and quite a bit of processing. So first we shared link level entanglements between neighboring nodes. Then we stretched it using entanglement swapping and then we could use teleportation. In 1G, without encoding, we were mainly limited by the waiting time for the two-way classical communication and by the memory coherence time of the quantum memories. If we used encoding, that we removed this requirement for the waiting time for the two-way classical communication and we were only limited by the memory coherence time. So it looked like entanglement is needed for uh, efficient long-distance quantum communication. In fact, this is not quite true. We can have both long-distance communication without pre-shared entanglement. And this is the topic of this step. What we need to use is again quantum error correction, but this time we're going to use loss-tolerant encoding. Using this, we can tolerate certain amount of losses, so we can lose some of the physical qubits that we send down the optical fiber without destroying the message that we're trying to communicate. And again, there is no need for two-way communication at all. So how it's going to work is the following. Let's say that we've got neighboring four nodes along a path in a network, and the first node prepares some state psi that it's trying to communicate to the others. What it's going to do is going to take this physical state and encode it in a tilde psi, and then it will send this block of physical qubits directly to the second node. Along the way, some of the qubits are going to get lost. So the state that node 2 receives will no longer be pure, but it's going to be some uh, partially encoded mixed quantum state tilde rho. But what the second node does, it looks at this state, it recovers, it detects any errors, and it re-encodes the message again and sends a fresh block of qubits that encode the logical state tilde psi to the third node and so on. And we repeat this cycle of recovery, re-encoding and transmission again and again until hop by hop we reach uh, our destination. So the rate is now not limited by the distance, it's not even limited by the quantum memory time coherence, but it's limited by the speed of local operations. So the faster we can perform this uh, recovery and re-encoding, the faster we can uh, transmit the, uh, uh, the message. And what we do, one way of doing this, is using quantum parity code. This code takes the physical state, which is some superposition, alpha 0 plus beta 1, and encodes it into the following state. So this is a pretty complicated state, so let's take it slowly and analyze what each bit means. We have two new parameters. We've got parameter m and n. n is the number of logical qubits, and m is the number of physical qubits comprising one logical qubit. So before we were always uh, encoding our information into a single logical qubit. Here we've got multiple logical qubits. So these are represented by these kets. This ket psi1 is the first logical qubit. Ket psi2 is the second logical qubit. And each logical qubit is comprised of m physical qubits. So you can imagine that this state is not really a single qubit, it's m qubits. 
this state is also m qubits, and so on. And here are the, uh, this is the state of the logical qubits. We've seen this in, uh, in the previous step. So the uh, m qubit logical plus state is basically a GHZ state of m qubits. And similarly for the minus state, just we change this sign from a plus into a minus. Now, how do we perform recovery? Imagine that we've got the simplest such, um, such uh, loss-tolerant code, where m and n are both equal to 2. So now we've got four physical qubits. The state can be written in the following way. We've got alpha, logical qubit plus, logical qubit plus, plus beta, logical qubit minus, logical qubit minus. And each logical qubit is comprised of two physical qubits. If we write it out in full in the physical qubit form, this is what we get. So this bell pair here, 0, 0, plus 1, 1, represents our first logical qubit. Now let's say that um, we lose the second physical qubit of the second logical qubit. That means the fourth physical qubit. In other words, we lose this last qubit over here. How do we represent the state after losing the fourth qubit? What we do is we take the partial trace over this fourth qubit, represented over here. We can write it out. It's a pretty complicated, um, complicated um, expression. But note that really, as we said before, um, when we we're talking about the basic strategy for 3G repeaters, it's a mixed state. Now, how do we recover? from the loss of the fourth qubit. What we need to do is we need to measure the remaining qubit of the second logical qubit in the z basis. If we get the outcome plus one, then that collapses the remaining state of physical qubit onto this form, which is basically the form we started with without the presence of the second logical qubit. If we get the outcome minus one uh, of our z measurement, we are collapsing the state of the remaining two physical qubits onto this form. So the only difference between these two is this phase uh, over here. Whether we get a plus one or a minus one, it doesn't really matter. With simple local operations, we can re-encode the state again and recover the following encoding. All of this is happening at the second node. So now the second node has uh, recovered the original message and it can retransmit it again to, no, to the following node, node 3. So how many qubits are we allowed to lose? Before we saw that a loss of one qubit was not really a problem. There are two rules that tell us um, how many qubits we can actually lose. The first one is that at least one physical qubit in each logical qubit must arrive. That means along the way, we cannot use all m physical qubits comprising one logical qubit. And the second rule is that for one logical qubit, for at least one logical qubit, all of the physical qubits must arrive as well. If these two conditions are satisfied, then our recovery succeeds. If not, then our recovery fails. For example, for the case of m and n equals to 2, we're only allowed to lose a single qubit. If we lose two qubits from the same logical qubit, we don't satisfy the first condition. And if we lose two qubits, one from each logical qubit, then we don't satisfy the second condition. So we're only allowed to lose a single, single qubit. Now, uh, we only talked about uh, loss errors and how to handle loss errors. We haven't talked about operational errors. But the quantum parity codes can handle some operational errors as well. For example, bit flips, faith flips, measurement errors. But uh, quantum parity codes are not the only codes that can be used for 3G repeaters. Again, our old friend, which we have mentioned multiple times, the CSS code works as well. So this concludes our basic description of 3G repeaters and also this lesson.